the admittance as we get started here. So hello, thank you again for joining those of you that are just signing on. My name is Kayla. You may or may not know who I am. Um, we have agents joining from several different agencies, so welcome, welcome. I am excited to give you guys a little bit of a, an overview for uh, where we've gone over the last year. So many different things have changed, um, ever fluctuating as far as what we can and can't do, what we can and can't say, ask for, uh, what kinds of things are required of us as property managers so that we're not stepping on any toes when it comes to residents and not paying rent. Um, I know that you as agents have a lot of clients that typically come to you either with the heartache of, oh, my tenant's not paying, what do I do, what can I do? Um, well, finally, you're gonna get a little bit better of an understanding as to where things stand. So I definitely want to just kind of start by saying, we're on your side, we're in your corner. If you ever have any specific questions, please either just drop them on the chat while you're here in the class. We'll address those as they happen throughout the next you know, half hour, 45 minutes. Um, and then otherwise, if it's if we sign off and you're like, oh, I knew I wanted to ask something, please don't hesitate to shoot us a question, email, give us a call, text. We are available to you and your clients both. So we want to be that advocate on your side. It's exactly what we do. So without further ado, we've pretty much slowed down on people trying to get in. So we're just going to kind of start right in. So what landlords need to know about evictions and COVID. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we've been staying afloat as far as uh, trying to stay on top of what's the latest of what we can do. Um, so let's delve in. A little bit of introduction as to who we are. We have a lot of people on the call today. So I want, I keep saying call, sorry, Zoom, class, meeting, we're all here. <laughs> so um, first and foremost, David Swaim and Dora Pinter, they're the co-founders of Service Star Realty. We've been in business for, since 2011. So not, not to say that that's all that they've been in. David himself has over 40 years of real estate experience. Dora, about 15 years of property management experience alone. Um, very, very educational, educated people. Definitely a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Michelle Nelson, operations manager, accounting specialist, organize, organizer of erratic activity. <laughs> Again, Jill of all trades, she's seen it all. She's the voice of reason. So she's gonna be walking you through the steps of the nitty gritty details today. Um, Ashley Bean, she is the business development manager, new client onboarding, dispeller, dispeller of myths and bad ideas. So when your clients ring up on the new client hotline, she's the first voice they're gonna hear. She answers all their questions, makes sure that they have a solid understanding of what they're getting themselves into with residential rentals, um, and a little bit better of understanding just how things work. Um, and then again, myself, Kayla Nelson, marketing director, um, HomeSmart coordinator. Those of you who are HomeSmart agents here today, you'll see my face clustered all over your flyers. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Artistic Spreadsheet Ninja. So the majority of what I do outside of Home Smart Coordination is the uh, website presence with social media, the company, just making sure that our, our face and our brands are out there. Um, I also work hand in hand with the business development side of the company. So I as well answer any kind of new client questions um, and onboarding paperwork, things like that. So. All right. And again, just as you have any questions throughout please feel free to drop them in the chat. I did get one or two questions emailed to me outside of this, so we'll address those as the day goes on. Um, so what you're gonna take away today, understanding the process, timelines, best practices, payment plans. It may seem simple, but you'll find out later that there's a lot that goes into it. <laughs> CDC forms and forbearance, um, what forbearance is and how it can help you and your clients. The long-term effects of COVID. So basically, you know, where we started when everything hit the fan, as far as how it's evolved over the past year. Um, 
You'll find out how COVID takes a toll on as far as what landlords can and can't report on their residents as they come and go from their rental properties. Um, and then rental payments and eviction statistics, kind of what we've seen as we've navigated through the year. Um, dispelling common misconceptions. We get a lot of frequently asked questions and a lot of times people are off base as far as what they feel they understand. So hopefully by the end of this session, you'll have a, a little bit better grasp and you'll be able to guide your clients more easily. Common thoughts and myths, again, same concept. Um, creative solutions that we have been successful with. So we'll share those little tidbits as we come up to the different topics themselves. First off, Miss Ashley. Yes. So this is a common myth that I hear a lot from um, new owners coming on thinking that, you know, they're going to be stuck with a resident that uh, is not paying and they can't evict them. Um, and we've learned that this is definitely not the case. There's definitely solutions that we've came up with um, since this has all started. Um, so, on to the mix. <laughs> so, go over those details of how they're going to pay rent? Yeah. Um, okay. So, one of the ways that we've um, came up with was payment plans. So, we had our attorney make a new form for the payment plans. We had to call all of our tenants that had went on that were claiming COVID um, and were not able to pay. So we called all of them, you know, worked out a payment plan with them. Um, Michelle made spreadsheets for all of this so we can keep track of who's on payment plan, when they're playing, and there was a lot of work that went involved in this. Um, we also made a list of associations that um, the that we could give to the tenant so that they can get assistance um, for the rent and um, kind of help them out so that they can pay. Um, and then we also helped our owners understand forbearance. We've made videos and what that they can do um, to help so that, you know, what they can do to make sure that they don't go into default. Um, and there was, you know, many ways that they can do this. So it had to be a government backed loan. Um, so the only loans that, that wouldn't be available for this would be um, a private loan or if they didn't have a loan. Um, and then, yeah, so that was the different types of loans. And then, um, we made videos and stuff with that to help them understand. Um, and then, you know, the CARES Act with the moratorium, um, we helped explain that with the, our attorney and, um, you know, made videos and stuff with that with our owners as well. Okay, so, Kayla, go ahead. Sorry, I accidentally skipped forward too many slides. <laughs> I was going back. Yes, I did. So, the, I, and again, Ashley is kind of hitting the nail on the head as far as the biggest thing that we have found is to be a success is communication. Just mm -hmm. constant, both with our residents and our owners. Um, the videos she's mentioning, David and Dora themselves recorded educational you know, this is what you can expect. These are your avenues that you have available to you, owners and tenants alike. Um, so we definitely were made ourselves available to them. Um, it, it, something I kind of want you guys to understand as we go through the next parts of the slides is the slides may come across as, oh, let's, let's evict everybody. Let's, <laughs> I just want to say first and foremost, that is absolutely not our main goal. Our main goal is to keep the resident up to date and current with their rent. We're bending over backwards, working with them day in, day out. Um, I was talking with our property managers earlier this morning. They were saying that on average, it's three to five conversations for just one resident to make a payment plan. We're discussing when can they make their next payment. We're discussing the situation that they found themselves in. Um, and not only that, as soon as you make the payment plan, situation 
they change. Everything is just constantly evolving, even on an individual residence scale. So um, you may seem, it may seem that it's easy to create one payment plan, but then before you know it, you know, two days later, we have to create a fresh one because the last one is kind of obsolete. It doesn't apply to their situation anymore. Apologies. Sorry about that. My son came home, my dog went off. <laughs> um, anyhow, so the residents have so many different lines of assistance available to them. Um, both on the city level. So any any city level assistance, um, community levels. There's several different churches that offer so many different kinds of assistance, not necessarily just rent assistance. There's utility assistance, food assistance, there's shelters, childcare. So that list that Ashley mentioned, these are all things and resources that we help make the residents aware of how and where they can reach out. Um, Again, earlier I was talking with our property managers about different success stories. And for the majority of it, we are seeing great results because the, so many times our residents are, are getting assistance quickly to the point where it's not even becoming a problem and they're not falling behind in rent, needing to even make the payment plan to begin with because they're receiving it so quickly. They're being proactive because of the information that's being so readily given to them. So without further ado, learning what you can't do or what you can do as far as trying to resolve outside of the resident being able to get assistance outside of just open communication. Um, a little bit of where we've been throughout the year. So this is the statistics of where we were from last summer. And then I'm gonna give you this kind of the same statistics as to where we're at right now so that you can see exactly the, the success rate. Um, so again, in the summer, we had approximately 710 properties under our management, uh, single family homes. On average, about 40 of our residents each month were on, on payment plans. Um, 10 of those were residents that claimed they were getting assistance. So that 10 is still kind of worked into that 40, but you can clearly see that not everybody who is wanting to make a payment plan is applying themselves and being proactive to actually have got that assistance. Um, and then regularly we had about three different residents that had some form of default on their payment plan. So they couldn't complete their months of payment, their months payment before month's end. Um, now three, oh, kind of does sound a lot. But then when you look at it in the grander scheme of things of 710 properties, um, it, it doesn't look quite so bad proportionally. As opposed to where we're at now. So we're above 740 properties now. Um, and on average, we have about 10 residents that are on payment plans. Um, and then again, four of those incorporated into that 10 uh, residents submitted the CDC documents and or getting assistance. On average, we have sent about three people to the attorney each month, resulting in about one eviction a month. Again, one eviction, it does kind of sound like a lot, but then in the grander scheme of things, 99% of our residents have been able to remain current. So that to us is a huge success rate and it's definitely goes into how you react with the resident when they start to say, hey, I'm late. Okay, what do we need to do? Let's get it rolling, being proactive about it all. Ms. Michelle. So I'm going to just try not to be boring with just statistics and stats and details, but I want to give you a mainframe first of the Are you basic. Me boring? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> My stuff is boring. Um, the minutia of the process, I want to just kind of gloss over and give you generics and then we can go into details if needed. So the basic eviction, not COVID, 
Just a tenant not paying rent, we are very structured on what we can and can't do as far as when we can get rid of a tenant or evict them. So we send our five days on the fifth of the month. Um, we can't send them to the attorney for 11 days, so that's usually the 16th. Um, it's a little bit more complicated now with COVID, but we'll just keep it simple for now. So we send them to the attorney on the 16th. We usually get a court date five to seven days later, and then we can get the judgment uh, the same day as the court case, and then we can order the writ, which is the eviction, five days after court. Um, and then whenever the we order the judgment or the writ, the constable will call us usually two to three days later, depending on how busy he is. So that is a normal, basic, run-of-the-mill eviction. And at any time in this process, the tenant can get paid in full and stay in the house and stop this process. Of course, they have to pay all legal fees, all late fees. But at any point in this process, they can pay in full and get back into the house, and I can satisfy the judgment. Um, we've had tenants where we locked them out, and they brought us back all the money. So we've, we've had to let people back in if the owner agrees, even after lockout, if they pay all of the fees. Okay, so evictions now with COVID. Oh. oh. Do you have any questions so far? Oh, yeah, so far. <laughs> the basic Let's eviction. You, we have one that was dropped in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Jeannie, I know David answered you, but I'll, I'll read it as well. So she asks, um, how can I be sure summer month to month renters will leave in August when I have another renter? I heard moratoriums prevent me from making someone leave if they claim COVID. And again, David already kind of addressed it, saying that claiming COVID is more related to non-payment of rent. You are able to issue a non-renewal, especially on a month to month, so long as you give them the proper notices. Um, as far as whether or not they become a holdover resident, there is a whole different set, uh, different set of regulations to follow them. I have a renter that gave 30 days notice to move uh, so that they can sell. If the client doesn't leave, will the same eviction process be in place? Now you gave them 30 days notice to move. Was that at the end of their term? It depends on what length the resident had as as a lease term um, in a, um, on a month to month. So again, if they if they stay after their term and you've given them their notice, it's not quite the same. That becomes what's called a holdover tenant. And again, there's a little bit different process in place for that. Michelle, do you have more details on what that process may be or? Really, it's essentially still an eviction. With a holdover tenant, you're just sending it, you're st still sending the file to the attorney. It's just a, a holdover eviction as opposed to a non-payment of rent eviction. It's just a little bit different. There's also, however, the rent due is, what is it, uh, two times or one and a half times the uh, normal rent? So I think it's two times. Two times. <clears throat> it's very expensive for them to hold over. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Let's ride along. Um, okay, so to, um, is, a, is it for a lease violation or is it for non-payment or rent? These are two different kinds of evictions. Um, a lease violation would be unauthorized pet. There's lots of reasons for a lease Crime. violation. Huh? Crime. Operating. Crime. Business. Yep. Opposite to the lease all kinds of reasons. Anything that happens to be in your lease is a lease violation. Um, and that's different than a non-payment of rent. Um, and just a side note, if you do violate, if you are sending the tenant to eviction for an, a, viol a lease violation, uh, you don't want to accept rent or you want to accept rent and then send them the violation so you don't counteract the others. And again, those are more details you'd want to ask like an attorney <laughs> if you have both of those issues. Um, so the first thing we do, if there aren't any questions about that, the first thing we do when we are filing an eviction now during COVID is I have questions I have to ask. Did the tenant supply a CDC form? If they did, there's another form that we send them that they have to fill out. If they're filling those items out, I can't send them to the attorney. We have to work out the forms. There are forms, I can send them to the attorney and then the attorney will decide on a case-by-case -case basis 
But again, I don't make that decision. If, if they've submitted the forms and they're still not paying rent, they're still not doing payment plans, they're not getting assistance, I forward it to the attorney and then they will advise us on what we can and can't do. So there are different stages of that process. Um, if at any time I've sent them to the attorney and they submit the declaration form or CDC form, I have to immediately, immediately tell the attorney and they will hold off on the eviction while we're doing the, the CDC declarations. Um, I also have to ask if the owner got forbearance. So if they had a federal loan, which I have to look up, I then have to notify the attorney if they got help or not. Um, so there's all kinds of forms I have to fill out nowadays for COVID, but we have still successfully evicted a ten tenants even in during COVID because a lot of them either don't care that there's help out there and they don't try or they aren't just aren't affected by COVID and they're just not paying rent for other reasons. So we're still having successful evictions during this time. Now, last year it was a little harder and everything was kind of on hold and it was just make payment plans with $200, which we don't, usually when we do a payment plan, we require 50% of what's due on the day. But last summer it was, oh, I have $200. Great, let's get you on a payment plan. <laughs> and it was payment plan, payment plan, and we'd redo the payment plan uh, just to keep people in the houses and just to keep money flowing to the owners. Um, so at any point, if you have an owner who starts mentioning all these things, they need to go to an attorney because it changes every day. Every month they get new updates on the moratoriums or it gets forward, you know, it gets postponed to the next month. So we're constantly in communication with our attorneys on what's the latest update and what we can and can't do. Um, I think that's it, unless people have questions. You're having success with the um, payment plans and getting people current? Payment uh, plans? Maybe, maybe yes. that's coming up later. Payment plans, I mean, I can, do we have another screen on payment plans, Kayla? I don't, um, know. I don't yeah. want to jump in. No, no, that's yeah, fine. We do. Yes, we do have another screen on payment plans, but it's more so, um, it's more so just what to, to include in them. As far as making sure that, you know, to be able to attest to how successful they are, I think that the, the fact that 90%, 99% of our residents have been able to stay current um, and about two to three percent, if I'm doing that math correctly, um, are on payment plans, uh, the majority of the, of the residents are able to stay accurate and up to date. I know that um, especially if they're receiving assistance, I do have one that, um, a property manager mentioned that she, you know, along with payment plans and assistance, she's been able to collect $8,400 from assistance, not to mention a credit of $1,800 being ready to apply to the next month's rent. So it's just, I can't attest to how successful it's been with the, the active communication and just staying on top of it, being there for the residents. Um, as far as, um, I, there was one other thing, Michelle, that I was wanted to kind of piggyback off of you. Yes. Um, and then I don't, we found that, you know, you mentioned the fact that a lot of residents aren't going through the hassle of filling out the CDC form and creating assistance. And we found that even to be true, not even to the eviction level just yet, but even when they're in the beginning stages of making their payment plans, it, it almost feels as if it's a hassle to them to try and prove that they need assistance so they don't. And sometimes it may seem counterintuitive, but that's not the worst situation for your client to be in. Um, we're just trying to stay ahead of it all. Well, I think too, though. You said that you have to fill out forms on the forbearance. So how does that affect whether the owner is on forbearance or not? How does it affect the eviction? Well, so far it hasn't. I've only had one owner who got a for, uh, got forbearance, but he got it last year and he only got it for a couple months and we still were able to file. So he didn't continue the forbearance for the entire year. So it, that, one, that particular one hasn't been affected. Most of my owners either are on private loans or they're on federals and they didn't take the forbearance. So. But had they taken the forbearance, you could not have evicted the tenant. Correct. Back a year ago, that's correct. If it was a current forbearance and they were not paying, mm -hmm. the, we were not able to evict. Right. Yep. 
So this is a common myth that we see a lot of self-managers do, um, which is forgiving the rent this one time. It's not helpful for the tenant. Um, and there's a lot of other options that you can do besides forgiving the rent. And um, Michelle will explain more of those. <laughs> Quite simply, if you forgive rent, they're gonna want forgiveness next month and next month, and they're gonna want late fees. Unfortunately, when you give people an inch, they take a mile. And even if you say this time, one time only, it's not in your best interest for you financially and or the owner financially, and the tenant will always ask for more. It's one time is never enough. So it's just not a good practice. Maybe doing a, an addendum to split. We did have some that uh, agreed to allow a tenant to pay their back rent in increments of $200 over the rest, course of the rest of the lease. That makes more sense. It keeps the tenant honest. It keeps them current, behind but current. It makes it, it shows an effort that they're trying to get caught up. That to me is a better suggestion than just completely forgiving it. And Michelle, how does it affect the, uh, how, how do the fair housing uh, laws come into play when you're forgiving rent? <laughs> you forgive for one, you have to forgive for everybody. You can't do one <laughs> and not the others. <laughs> That, that if, if, uh, if you have uh, just one house and one tenant, it uh, really doesn't come that much into play, but when you're dealing with hundreds of people. Yes, if you're self-managing, yeah. correct. Yeah, if you're self-managing, you can do whatever you want. I just, yeah. <laughs> if you're a self-manager and you forgive it, they'll probably ask for forgiveness next month too. Yeah. All right. Oh, look, payment plans. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Michelle, a proper payment plan, what goes into them? A proper payment plan goes into a plan of it. You need a non waiver agreement, which simply states we are not waiving any of our rights to evict you. We're not, evi we're not waiving any of our rights to send you the attorney. This is still in our lease, this is still a contract. You still owe the rent. That always has to be in a payment plan. Um, you're always going to make sure you have a substantial amount upfront money. We always do 50% of what's due on the day they want to do the payment plan. Um, and then it, we require that it's paid in full by the end of the month, not to go into the next month. Um, it was a little more complicated during COVID. They still had all the COVID paper pay, payment plan forms that we got from the attorney still had a non-waiver just the verbiage was a little weaker as far as eviction so the first one we had was just you still have to reaffirm your lease you still owe this money but the the kind of the eviction part was kind of like smooshed over it was like right at the beginning it was pretty much just do payment plans but they always have that non-waiver it's still a contract you still owe the money um so that i mean if rule one always have that in there and the other part the other part of a payment plan it also says this is in lieu of a five day notice, which is, if you guys remember on that other slide is step one, in order to send them to an eviction, you need to send a five day notice. The payment plan has that built in. So at any time they default, they don't come in with the second payment, you can immediately send them to the attorney. You don't have to start over with a five day. I did have a question in the chat. It says, are new renters as of today able to fill out the CDC forms and avoid rent? And is there an end to this? Um, there's a second question and they, they kind of tie in together. So I'm going to address them as one. Are you able to ask the applicants if their job or income is affected by COVID? So I feel like we handle avoiding both of these by our increased screening process. Um, we... I don't know that we would ask the specific question of, are you already affected by COVID? Um, but more so, you just want to make sure that their last two pay stubs that they're trying to qualify with aren't their last two pay stubs. <laughs> so you can do an employment verification, making sure that their job that they're trying to qualify with is still a valid and accurate job position, um, as well as not taking unemployment as quote unquote income, because at any point that unemployment income can no longer be qualified for or so many other factors. Um, but then 
you are kind of already preventing whether or not um, they're going to need to fill out the CDC form right off the bat by making sure that it's a valid position at the moment. Um, now, once they're in the property and they have a valid lease, if something happens to their position and then they need to file to, excuse me, to fill out the CDC form, then yes, unfortunately that is something that can happen, that it could happen. Um, but the best thing you can do is just be stringent with your screening process. Um, if, if you have a, if you have a bartender who's uh, applying versus someone, uh, a postal worker, chances are the bartender is going to be more susceptible to a business closing down rather than the postal work closing down. So we make choices, logical choices on what it's going to, what's the best for the owner. So uh, if that's the only application I would have, then it would be a little bit different story. But lately, we're getting multiple applications on an ongoing basis. So uh, we usually have thick of a litter. We also caught some, caught um, by uh, verifying the rental history. We had one case a couple of months ago where um, just by verifying the rental history, we realized that they weren't paying rent to the previous landlord. They were claiming COVID there and they were going to come over and rent from us and not on not on basis of having COVID or infected by COVID, just, just on the basis of not sure with rental history, we were able to uh, save the property owner from uh, a problem situation up front. We do have another question. It says, if a tenant refuses to agree to a payment plans and or does not want to sign a nine waiver, will you then proceed to evict? Quite simply, yes. We lay the groundwork as soon as they're laid on their rent. If they refuse to come current and they don't sign the payment plan, then yes, that's the next course of action. And that's in, that's in your client's best interest because how many times, I know I've spoken with a lot of owners that have, you know, they're running on two and three months worth of no income from their resident because they are dragging the feet, their feet or they're not following through with their payment plan. Um, that's, it's just us serving the best interest of our clients. Um, and your clients who are trusting us to take care of their investment for you. Did we address the previous uh, one? One more thing. I think the conversation with, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dora. No, go ahead. One of the things I think that we are um, kind of glid gliding over is the conversations we have with the tenants. The tenants are of the mind quickly saying, oh, I don't have to pay rent. Ha, 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 ha. Well, that's not the case. They do have to pay rent. And if they don't pay it now, they have to pay it later. And it's this realization that we bring to their attention of saying, this is going to turn into a mountain of a problem that's going to follow you around for years and ruin your credit and be a problem. We're not going to just sit idly by and say, that's okay. So we're going to go to the links of making sure this happens. And you need to be aware of that. And you need to pay your rent. Here's a few options. Here's this, here's that. Here's relief over here. So once they start to know what the ground rules are, they don't think it's such a great idea and they pay their rent. That's why we have success. And I see a new question here, which uh, actually I was gonna, I felt that we didn't answer that question. So I was gonna go back to that. Uh, I, I believe that uh, Ron is asking here, what questions we can ask and if, if we can legally ask if they are sick or perhaps they have a vaccine and once maybe there's vaccine certifications or, or IDs or maybe we can ask for that, but uh, it's just a little early for that, I think, and we haven't even, this would be something that we ask our attorney. But as far as what questions we can ask if somebody is, is currently sick, uh, we cannot ask those questions. We try to avoid asking them uh, whether they're disabled or just sick or anything like that. So. Um, we can, we could ask it, so we could ask a question if they presently have something. For example, we have a question on our application, uh, if they have service animals or if they are uh, currently planning on filing um, bankruptcy. So we ask questions and if you, if you want to build your own questions on your application, because that's what I think that you 
going towards is you can ask questions and you're not going to break any law uh, by circumventing <laughs> circumventing the real question if they are actually sick now. So you could ask, are you planning on filing or are you in the process of filing a CDP form? Yes, you can ask a question. If they say no to that, then there's a second side to it. You can never ever evict them because they filed it, but you can then evict them for lying on the application. So asking the right questions on the application can screen out or trap people into lying in the application, meaning yes, you can ask the question. So I don't know if I'm, I'm making sense. It's a little tricky because certain questions we can't ask. We can't ask, are you a smoker? <laughs> no, but we can say no smoking in the property. So these are all, uh, you know, there's so many um, hot and fair housing and all kinds of um, protective laws against uh, people with, uh, you know, we can't ask if you're a female or a male or if you have kids or not. So anyhow, you have to be careful with the questions and how you form the questions. But if they do lie outright on the application, then you could evict them for lying on the application, not for what they are or what they have or what form they, they're filing. Okay. All right. So did you know COVID and rental verification? So this is kind of piggybacking off of Dora's, uh, you know, you're, you definitely want to be aware of what you can and cannot ask when you have a resident that is either applying for your property or if you're being asked for the verification um, or your client more specifically. Um, oh, well this resident, you know, they claimed COVID so I kicked them out. <laughs> They can't say things like that. So it's definitely just a sensitive subject to where they need to be aware and, and tread lightly, circumvent without actually saying. <laughs> well, I think before we move on from that, we can ask the question, did they pay their rent on time? And wow. if they decide they want to answer saying those deadbeats claim COVID and never, never, never paid, we're, we're not guilty of doing anything wrong. Now, they're not supposed to be doing that, but we can still get the answer if we ask the question. We don't ask if, if they've done anything about COVID, but we just ask if they paid their rent on time. So many times, a simple question gets a lot of answers. Well, it's a good idea is for this very reason to avoid having phone um, rental verifications over the phone. We, we always do it in writing for this very reason because we don't really want to have the non-factual information and have that non-factual information influence us. So definitely the question is just if they paid their rent or not. Yeah. And on the other hand, we're not able, if somebody comes to us and asks us for rental history, and we have somebody with COVID, we're not, we're not allowed to disclose that. So we're not gonna choose to share that with a landlord who is asking about one of our previous tenants. Yeah. COVID and collection. So residents that have filed for COVID related assistance in the past, it, it may affect the ability to send them to collections and or have that actually go on their record. Now they're definitely still responsible for that outstanding balance. Let's say it's a month and a half's worth of unpaid rent at the time of their eviction. Um, the, the source information that we have was a little bit contradictory. Some said yes, some said questionable. Um, so just be aware that it may affect whether or not you can send them to collections for their outstanding debt. Um, we're gonna kind of speed it along in case you guys have any other questions. COVID claims have negative ramifications. Their judgments, they stay on their record. Outstanding rent is still owed kind of you know, again, what I just said, if they were evicted and they had a month and a half's worth of previous rent unpaid, that balance stays on their civil record. That's going to affect their future applications for new properties that they're trying to rent um, and something that you yourself could look at uh, if you're trying to process an application 
the screening process, I already kind of mentioned a lot about that and how you can step up, you know, verifying employment, whether it's current and accurate. Um, don't count unemployment income as actual income because you never know when that benefit's going to run out, whether or not it's going to increase, decrease, actually be what you need. Um, so just be aware that those are things that you should pay attention to or that we pay attention to most, most importantly. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining. And I know that we kind of, it was a big summary. So if there is any more specific information that you guys are looking for, please don't hesitate to reach out, let us know. Um, and again, your client doesn't have to do it alone. We are here, we are able to be that voice of reason for you and for your client, uh, starting as little as 69 a month. <laughs> There are several different numbers that they can reach out to new client hotline right there on the screen. Most usually it's going to be Ashley that answers. If she's unavailable, then it rings through to me as well, as well as our direct lines. Hello, just one question just came in quickly. Yes. Is there a summary or a PDF to give at least signing? Um, in regards to what you have available to somebody or a summary of what? COVID. Um, there really isn't anything that we have existing today, um, but all of the assistance websites, as well as the CDC assistance information, um, is very readily found online. Um, or warning about the prices. It's more something that we would address when they become... Process. Oh, it's, sorry. <laughs> about the process. Um, it's really something that we would start to have that conversation when we're approached of, I may not be able to make my rent this month. Exactly. I mean, it's not advisable to tell them, just like they have a survey, they have a pet, we're not going to tell them, hey, if it's a service animal, you know, you can bring 10 of them in and uh, you don't have to pay pet fees or, you know, so it's not advisable to tell them up front what forms they have to file for COVID because then we're just giving them ideas, right? So Kayla was right, we just handle it once they come to us that they, they, they have been affected. Do we do collections? We don't do the collections ourselves, but we do have a third party that we contract with that we do send them out. One criteria I look for as a landlord but not required is if applicants are looking to purchase a home in the future. I'm a realtor. Am I able to ask if applicant is willing to get pre-qualified as a condition for moving forward with renting one of my properties? That would be a broker question. Your, as far as uh, a question that you could ask, yes, you can ask. You're going to be doing a credit report anyway. So the credit report uh, that you're requiring is just a little bit more in depth. It just happens to do with rent, with income verification and, and the abilities to figure out if they can qualify for a loan. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, our screening process is basically a credit report and background. It's very similar, but um, a, a specific lender's approval, if that's what you're wanting to do, then have at it, it's available. But careful, because if you have more than three properties, then you need to ask all of your tenants. So let's say that you're managing 10 properties, the <clears throat> application process has to be the same for all, unless the owner overrides sure. your process. So that's a little bit of fair housing to just keep in mind to treat people equally. Yep. But if that's your process, then great. Well, thank you guys so much, everybody. Thank you. This is fabulous. I'm, out hopefully you got a lot of information from it. Yes. Yes. Keep an and eye out. Everybody, feel free to reach out to us anytime uh, at Service Star Realty if you have any questions regarding property management or evictions. And Kayla, thank you so much for putting this beautiful uh, show together. Thank you. Keep an eye out in your emails and your social media. I, we have several different classes like this scheduled with varying topics over the next couple of months. So 
we look forward to being there for all of you. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, just one more question. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Um, Austin, your topic goes over breaking leases. Um, we will be covering that a little bit more towards one of our other classes, but I'll I'll get back to you in an email with a little bit more info. Thanks. All right. I have so many screens open. I need to find which one closes the meeting. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you, Kayla. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you. <laughs>